for being drunk and incapable. The 16-year-old boy was arrested in Leicester Square in central London. He was taken to a police station and released without charge two hours later. According to the Prime Minister's official spokesman, Ewan gave a false name, age and address to the police. He now says he's sorry. It was just before 11 o'clock last night that a police officer on patrol in London's Leicester Square found a teenager lying on the ground. He appeared to be drunk and incapable and had been vomiting. An ambulance was called because the police were concerned about his condition, but paramedics decided treatment wasn't needed. At first, the police didn't know it was the Prime Minister's son, seen here on a family holiday two years ago. Downing Street said Ewan had lied to the police. His identity was established only when he was searched. Mr Blair himself made no comment as he left Downing Street this morning, but his spokesman issued a statement. It said Ewan Blair told police his name was Ewan John, suggested he was 18, not 16, and gave an old address. Special branch officers were sent to Charing Cross Police Station to identify Ewan after he'd been arrested. The police have powers to arrest anyone who appears drunk in a public place and incapable of taking care of himself. Ewan was released without charge at 1am. The Blairs will have to go to the station with their son at a later date to find out if further action will be taken. Until last week, Ewan Blair was a pupil at the London Oratory School. He's just left after finishing sitting his GCSE exams. Downing Street said Ewan was very sorry for the inconvenience he'd caused to the police, the state he was in, and for making a false statement. The arrest is clearly distressing for the Prime Minister, who's recently expressed concern about young people, alcohol and antisocial activity. But there's no suggestion that Ewan was involved in disorderly behaviour. Jane Peel, BBC News. Our political editor, Robin O'Clee, is at Westminster. Robin, the Blairs are very protective parents, aren't they? This is a, rather an embarrassment for them. What was the scene at Downing Street this morning? Well, I think it's been a pretty uncomfortable morning for young Ewan. Uh, his parents are described by Alistair Campbell, the Prime Minister's press spokesman, as strict disciplinarians, and they're said to be still very much exploring the circumstances of all this. Obviously, they very much regret uh, Ewan Blair uh, getting involved with the police in this kind of way, and it is a huge embarrassment to a Prime Minister who's been saying very strong things about football hooliganism uh, and about uh, people being drunk and disorderly, uh, and with the government uh, bringing forward a, a bill to deal with football hooligans. Now, there's no suggestion at all that uh, Ewan Blair was involved in any kind of disorderly conduct or hooliganism. As the Downing Street spokesman put it, uh, it's rather difficult to uh, act like a hooligan when you're lying in the gutter being sick. But obviously this is a very bad thing for uh, the Prime Minister's image and not the kind of thing that he wants his children to get mixed up in. Indeed. Well, well I mean, now the Prime Minister and his wife have got to go to the police station to talk it all over. What could the police do? Well, the police can either uh, reprimand uh, Ewan Blair uh, or caution him or they can charge him with being drunk and incapable. But this being a first offence, it would uh, seem unlikely that he would be charged but his parents will have to go through the business of accompanying him to the police station. And it's difficult for Mr Blair because, of course, he, his style as a politician has been a rather pious and preachy one, and opponents will make fun of this, although they will have sympathy with the Blair's predicament. Indeed. Robin Oakley, thank you very much indeed. England won't be hosting the World Cup in 2006. The executive of the governing body of world football, FIFA, announced in Zurich an hour ago that England and Morocco have both been eliminated in the voting and it's now a straight contest between South Africa and Germany. Our sports correspondent, Neil Bennett, is inside the hall in Zurich where the result is expected at any moment. Neil, it's a very nail-biting moment. What's going on? It certainly is, Anna, and I suppose with football we should have uh, expected the unexpected. This whole announcement was due to be carefully coordinated at one o'clock sharp, but as we already know, part of the announcement has leaked out in advance, come out in advance. We now know that uh, Morocco will not be staging the 2006 World Cup, and nor will England. World football's power brokers began voting this morning, and an hour and a half later, the results of the first two rounds were known. Morocco were the first to be eliminated, leaving England to fight it out with the two front runners, Germany and South Africa. The votes then cast broke English hearts. England 2, Germany 11, South Africa 11.
England was therefore eliminated from further voting. We have your reaction. No, no, no. We don't have reaction to what? We don't know the result yet. Yeah, they've yeah. announced the first yeah. two rounds yeah. of voting. Yeah. Yes, well, we have, we'll, we'll make comment afterwards. Yeah. The England bid team didn't really expect to hear good news in Zurich. But as they arrived at the conference hall okay, where the winners right, are yeah. announced, there was deep disappointment, if not surprise. But there never was room for two bidders from Europe. Well, as we now know, Anna, the two front runners, Germany and South Africa, are running neck and neck, 11 votes each. So it's now down to those crucial two votes which were cast for England. We think that uh, they were the votes of Scotland and New Zealand. We're pretty sure that Scotland will plump for Germany as fellow UEFA members, so it really all comes down to the New Zealand vote. Uh, there is a rumour sweeping the hall. It's only a rumour. We know no more than that that New Zealand have abstained. We certainly won't know for sure until the FIFA president, Sepp Blatter, makes the formal announcement. He's on the stage at the moment. The announcement is expected any minute. So let's cross over to uh, Sepp Blatter and hear what he has to say. To the bidding national associations and to their countries, England, Germany, Morocco, South Africa, and also to Brazil, who withdraw at the beginning of this week. Appreciation for the quality of their bids and for their commitment to the cause of the game. It has been a particular pleasure for FIFA to work with the bidding committees and to learn from them what their country is ready to accomplish or has prepared to accomplish for the FIFA World Cup. Generally speaking, I can say that the campaigns have been conducted in a fair way, not too aggressive, in the spirit of the game. The fact that the FIFA was able to choose among four high-level bidding committees, countries and association, which has never been the case before in the FIFA World Cup, also underlines the supreme status of the FIFA World Cup as the world's most prestigious single sports event. Finally, the executive committee was placed in front of two alternatives. To be innovative, to invest with courage and trust in a new continent, or to stand with the established football powers. Well, obviously, Anna uh, Sepp Blatter still making his uh, introductory remarks. The uh, timing of all this is a bit unpredictable. We're promised the final announcement sometime between one o'clock and five past, and we think it's coming very soon now. So let's go back to Sepp Blatter. Through vote, and he had a difficult task, I can tell you, to choose among the remaining four valid, valuable candidates. As you know, it has taken three rounds of voting or three ballots, supervised by a Swiss notary and another neutral controlling person to determine the winner. For transparency's sake, but you know it already, in the first round, Morocco got the least number of votes and was therefore not any longer in the race. In the second round, England got the least number of votes and was therefore also eliminated. So for the final round, the executive committee had to choose between South Africa and Germany. And now, we are going together to discover, thank you, General Secretary. You can see 
the seal of the envelope is yet intact. Here I have the name of the winner. And it will now be my great pleasure, with excitement, but also with a lot of interest, to open this envelope and to announce you the winner. First, I have to say that the result, the result is the nearest possible result which could have been attained in the third ballot. 12 to 11. 12 to 11. There has been one member not voting in the last ballot. And the winner is Deutschland. Well, Anna, that's just the most amazing turn up for the book, isn't it? There is the celebrating German delegation. Franz Beckenbau, prominent there, he led a fantastic campaign. What a contrast. That's South Africa. They really thought they'd got it in the bag. That crucial abstention by, we think, the New Zealand FIFA executive member, obviously critical. It's given Germany their second uh, World Cup. They held it, of course, in 1974. Uh, their presentation showed an awful lot more flair and imagination than the current German team. They had a fantastic presentation here yesterday. There again, so disappointed South Africa. They really thought they'd done everything. They made an, emo an emotional appeal, but they hadn't got it. There we are then, Anna. Amazing surprise. Nobody really expected that. Um, but we think we have the very first reaction from the British bid team. Sir Jeff Hurst, I think, has joined us here. Yes, it is me. Thank you very <laughs> much indeed, Jeff. Thanks for coming to the microphone so soon. You're welcome. Reaction to the result. Germany have done it again, haven't they? Yeah, well, we, we're disappointed. It's three and a half years hard work. I think during the last few weeks, uh, I think we had an indication it was going to not us. Um, probably a little surprise, in the, and this has only happened I think, in the last 48 hours that Germany became the favourites. But really just one of disappointment. I think by the very nature of this, this process uh, and the campaign, today was going to be a fantastic day for our country uh, and our, our bid team and myself, or, or a hugely disappointing day. And how, that's, uh, how did Germany do it? I mean, we always say never underestimate the Germans. How did they do it? How did they put one over us? Well, it's, on hard, us again? It's, hard to, it's hard to assess at the moment. Um, very difficult to assess. But congratulations to them. We all know they'll provide a great World Cup. They're a, a major footballing power and we're all confident that they will do a, a great job in hosting the World Cup in 2006. So congratulations to them. The critical question as far as the England bid is concerned, should it have been launched in the first place when we knew UEFA was behind Germany? Should we ever have entered the race I'm at all? I'm not going to get into that. I want to just have a few minutes to uh, re uh, think about this um, before we have our press conference. As far as we're going to start the press conference, our chief executive will make a statement. Bobby Charlton will also say a few words. Then Alec McGivern will say a few. We'll cover some of the, hopefully, some of the questions we're likely to get. And then we are quite prepared for the next, as long as it may be, to do individual interviews and then look at it from there. One last question. Will England ever bid for the World Cup again, do you think? That, again, is a question for the future on the analysis of what's happened in the last three and a half years. Again, it's, I'm not sure that question will be answered today by anybody. You need to look at that and analyse it the, uh, for the future. Jeff, thanks very much. You uh, will always have that memory of three goals at Wembley, of course. But Thank bad you. luck today. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, Anna, that's all the latest here from Zurich. Now back to you in London. Neil, extraordinary results. And, of course, there's despondency in the capital, Pretoria, in South Africa, where Greg Barrow is. But we're going over to Caroline Wyatt, who's in Berlin. Caroline Wyatt, this is an extraordinary result, isn't it? Much surprise, presumably, in, in Berlin at the moment. Surprise and absolute delight. The Germans had hoped against hope right up to the last minute, but they didn't in their heart of hearts believed it. Even Franz Beckenbauer, who headed the German bid, who himself played the last time that Germany hosted the World Cup in 1974, had complained that there was a plot afoot, that, that basically the votes were going to be rigged in favour of South Africa. But as it turns out, Germany has got it. They have said they will produce the best, the strongest 
and perhaps the most profitable World Cup in 2006. They've got all the preparations already underway. They're making sure that the country's 16th stadium, where they plan to hold it, will be in tip-top condition for the match. They have the security already sorted out, they say. And really, I think there will be rejoicing throughout the country and amazement. Well, over to Greg Barrow now in Pretoria. Greg, they were partying there earlier today, so there must be a terrible feeling of disappointment at the moment. There was huge expectation here. I, you can probably see just behind me, huge crowds of people came out from very early this morning to gather in this square. There's been, as you said, a party atmosphere. They've been releasing balloons. They've been dropping small parachutes from aeroplanes. South Africa really thought it had this event and it was really expecting the announcement to come in its favor. So it's just got to suddenly come to terms with that. Uh, most people around here just can't believe this result. Greg, was it something to do with the lack of preparation, the fact that quite a lot of the stadia hadn't actually been built yet? I think that would always have been a problem in South Africa, but we have to remember that all of those countries in the final round of this bid had uh, excellent uh, uh, preparations. They'd made excellent uh, reports to FIFA. They, they'd done all the homework they had to do. They had high standards in almost every respect. South Africa's bid was a paper bid in that it did have to build a number of stadia but really they felt that there was an emotional pull to bring the tournament to Africa and that the world would announce that when this bidding process went across. So in that respect, they're bitterly disappointed. And Caroline, it was the quality of Germany's bid, wasn't it, that really made all the difference? I think absolutely. Not only has it already had experience of hosting World Cup, it also hosted the European Cup very successfully indeed in 1988 bringing in the biggest viewing figures it's ever had. The stadia are here, they are built, they're of a very high international standard. And I think what may have clinched it in the end was also the aspect of safety, that policing here is very reliable, can be guaranteed, it's a low crime country, it's somewhere where visitors can come to very easily because of good transport links, it's at the heart of Europe. Germany also very much wanted it as a united country. In 74, when they last held it, it was just West Germany. This is a real symbol and a real triumph, I suppose, for German football, but for the nation as a whole. People here were very keen. Chancellor Schroeder himself went to Zurich to back the bid. They had the whole country behind them, and people here will be really celebrating tonight. Caroline Wyatt in Berlin, Greg Barrow in South Africa. Thank you both very much indeed. Now, if you've just joined us, a reminder of today's main story. Police have confirmed that the Prime Minister's 16-year-old son, Ewan, was arrested last night for being drunk and incapable. A 16-year-old boy was arrested in Leicester Square in central London. He was taken to a police station and released without charge two hours later. According to the Prime Minister's official spokesman, Ewan gave a false name, age and address to the police. He now says he's sorry. Leaders of the Protestant community in Northern Ireland have called for an end to the rioting of the last four nights. Both the moderator of the Presbyterian Church and the Grand Master of the Orange Order say the protests have got out of control. The protesters are angry at the decision to reroute an Orange Order march through Portadown on Sunday to avoid a nationalist area. The latest step in the security measures at Drum Cree. Soldiers bring in hundreds of yards of razor wire. This tactic was used during the last two years, just like the huge barrier on the road the Orangemen had been banned from taking into the nearby Catholic area. The wire will eventually extend along the fields in both directions, in and by the little stream that the security forces use as their stop line. By Drum Cree Church itself, on the other side of that line, there were a few onlookers as the soldiers went about their work. The crowds come in the evenings. Here, last night, the leading loyalist, Johnny Adair, with the binoculars, is identified with the largest loyalist paramilitary group, the UFF. His arrival seen by many as a sinister paramilitary presence. But the political party which represents the UFF said they had nothing to do with the violence. It's not orchestrated. In fact, if paramilitaries were involved, I think there'd be a lot less trouble on the streets. there will be more disciplined. But I'm not going to call for paramilitaries to get involved because that'll be misinterpreted. The Catholic residents of the Garvahi Road make their feelings clear. The head of the Orange Order, Robert Salters, has called for an end to violent protest. He said, we have asked them to keep a peaceful protest, not going out and causing mayhem on the streets. They definitely are damaging the Orange Order and we would call on them to cease immediately. All such calls have so far been ignored, 
At Drum Cree, protesters piled tires by the army barrier and set them alight. In Belfast, there were more disturbances in support of the Drum Cree Orange March. Young loyalists attacked the police in several areas. This is the scale of the disturbances of the last few nights. Car drivers and their passengers terrorised by Protestants in the name of a Protestant parade in a Catholic area where it's not wanted. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. Our Ireland correspondent Kevin Connolly is in Drum Cree. Kevin, it looks very quiet behind you, but this is a rather familiar pattern now, isn't it? Quiet during the day and, and hostile at night. That's right, Anna. There is a bizarre rhythm to all of this. Places where violence and mayhem can very quickly come to rule in the hours of darkness subside into peace and normality, as you see behind me now, in the hours of daytime. So there's no reason to suppose when darkness comes tonight that the same pattern won't repeat itself again. How big a split is there now between the Orangemen of Portadown, who see it as a matter of principle that they're allowed to make this march, and Orangemen throughout the rest of Northern Ireland? There are differences of emphasis, there's no doubt about that. I think there are elements within the Orange Order who are alarmed by the way in which this dispute now provides the kindling, the trigger, for a release of pent-up anger in the Loyalist community every year, and they would like to see any kind of face-saving deal that simply got this whole business sorted out. There are mechanisms that could be followed that could get it sorted out by those standards. But there are people in Portadown, absolutist on this, who see it as a matter of principle. This is what, after all, the Orange Order is all about. And for them, compromise it's, is much more difficult. And as long as that difference of emphasis is there, it's going to be very hard for the Orange Order to get involved in serious talks that will sort all this out. Now, there have been appeals, of course, from Orange leaders and from other religious leaders across the province to calm things down, but are people going to take any notice of them? I think the problem is that, as I say, in essence, Drum Cree is about Protestant Orange Order rights to march in certain routes. But the reality is the kind of loyalist protests which are triggered by this dispute are really being carried out by people who simply won't listen to that kind of appeal. Kevin, thank you very much indeed. Police searching for missing eight-year-old Sarah Payne have released a family video of the girl. They hope that recent pictures could help their search for Sarah, who went missing on Saturday night. Sussex police have scaled down the search for Sarah and instead are concentrating on what they call more targeted, focused searching. Right, good morning, ladies and gents. Day six of the inquiry. Um, we still haven't found Sarah. Still hopeful she's alive. Morning briefing for the team leaders on Operation Maple as the hunt for Sarah Payne shifts into a different gear. From now on, 150 officers will be targeting their effort in response to almost 2,000 calls offering information. Today we've got a whole load of more new officers. We've got another 30 officers starting again today. We're going to finish off Kingston Gores. The hunt for Sarah has spread far beyond the Sussex County borders. Detectives around the UK will now be interviewing potential witnesses and talking to dozens of registered sex offenders. We've looked through within the locality and then within Sussex, the sex offenders register, um, and run those sort of checks. Very often, actually, you find people are saying, well, we thought you'd be coming because we've worked this out for ourselves. Um, now we'd be looking at other forces doing a similar sort of uh, check in respect of their own. No one involved in or observing this inquiry can forget the images of Sarah herself. In this case, filmed at a family celebration just over a week ago, the identities of other children protected. Images that have helped police officers and the public to fight back fatigue and continue the search. There's a particular emphasis on areas that might have been missed. In this case, divers searching a pond on private property close to the point at which Sarah disappeared. Senior officers have asked local residents, especially those who've been away, to help them by checking gardens and outbuildings for anything unusual. The inquiry team is stressing that although no one is currently in custody, a number of important leads are being followed up. Tomorrow, they will stage a full reconstruction of Sarah's disappearance in the hope of provoking further vital information. Robert Hall, BBC News, West Sussex. Interest rates are to remain unchanged for the fifth month in a row. The Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee voted to keep base rates at 6%. The decision had been widely predicted by economists after signs that inflationary pressures may be easing. Tony Blair will address thousands of black church leaders and their followers this afternoon at a conference in Brighton. Tomorrow, William Hague will address the same audience. 
Our religious affairs correspondent, Emily Buchanan, examines the growing political influence of Britain's black Christians. The black majority churches are growing in confidence and they've started to flex their muscles. Their leaders, here warming up for the conference, claim a quarter of a million followers and they want more influence over government policy. They have been the fastest growing churches here in the United Kingdom for the last 40 years. The recent statistics show that 51% of all Londoners who attend church are black, which means they have a significant influence in what is happening within the development of Christian faith here. Many black churches have teamed up with local authorities to run projects like this one in East London. Young mothers, including non-Christians, are given job training with a personal touch. I'm a single mother, you know, and uh, they're really helping me to go back to work, to get my confidence back, because I think if it wasn't for them, probably I wouldn't think about taking this course. Meanwhile, churchgoers look after the trainees' children. The black churches have an enviable record preventing social exclusion, crime and drug addiction in their community. We believe that uh, we are supposed to touch people's lives with the love of Jesus Christ and that's exactly what we're doing through social action. And um, we believe that through the love that we express as Christians, society will be a better place to live in. No Prime Minister has ever addressed a black church gathering like this and there are high hopes here that Tony Blair will stop focusing on Middle England and address the concerns of the black community. Issues such as high unemployment, underachievement in schools and top of many people's list worries over the abolition of Section 28. Emily Buchanan, BBC News at the Brighton Conference Centre. Wimbledon is awaiting one of the most eagerly anticipated matches in the long history of the tournament. The Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, play each other on centre court this afternoon and the prize for the winner is of course a place in Saturday's final. Like many sisters, Serena and Venus Williams share most things, but this afternoon there's one thing one of them must do without, a place in the Wimbledon singles final. Even if they weren't related, their encounter would be fascinating. On one side of the net, Venus, all arms and legs and exceptional power. And on the other, Serena, two years younger, smaller, only marginally less powerful and with little extra finesse. They're insistent there's no chance that this afternoon's meeting will turn into a sisterly spat. <laughs> what no one seems to understand is that we're family and, you know, maybe it's natural for some people to be uh, jealous or angry, but that, that's not in us. We don't you. have that. Sure. So what will make the crucial difference between them on centre court? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, whoever wants yeah, most, maybe. Yeah. Wisely, Dad, who's coached them both since they were little, is staying strictly neutral and may not even turn up to watch. They don't need my support. If they was playing someone else, I would be there to give my support. But I wouldn't give my support to Venus to beat Serena, and I wouldn't give Serena my support to beat Venus. So my best bet, I think, is just to be neutral and stay away. Whichever Williams wins, it seems their power is taking women's tennis into a new era. Kevin Geary, BBC News, Wimbledon. And you can see more of that interview with Venus and Serena Williams at 1.45 here on BBC One. Love is the strangest thing, according to the song, but it could be stranger than we thought. Scientists have discovered that activity in one part of the brain is stimulated when people are shown pictures of those that they love. Our science correspondent, Christine McGurty, has the details. It was screen romance at its finest. For burning passion, it's hard to beat Darcy and Elizabeth. The smouldering looks said it all. In the real world, it happens every day. Love takes hold and you're inseparable. It seems to defy all rational explanation. Butterflies and excitement and you just light up. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Total delirium and probably... Um, Total irresponsibility, who cares what happens, you know. Totally even wantonness. <laughs> <laughs> now an experiment has been designed to get to the bottom of it. Volunteers said to be madly in love, each had a medical scan as they viewed images of their partner. The scientists saw a unique pattern of brain activity and say it's one of the most important they've ever identified. We must understand the, the brain mechanisms that have produced one of some of the greatest and loftiest uh, things in the, in the human race. It's all been, much of it has been done through the feeling of love and to understand the brain mechanisms underlying this is surely one of the noblest things that science can do. 
the fact that so many writers have been struggling to find analogies to explain how we feel that w w when we're in love um, it does tell us that a simple scientific explanation isn't actually um, going to help any of us analyse how we, how we feel at the time. It's clear there's a unique pattern of brain activity when you're madly in love, but many people will argue that the full passion of romantic love will never be explained by science alone. Christine McGurty, BBC News. 27 minutes past one, the main news again. Jenny Blair's 16-year-old son Ewan has been arrested in London for being drunk and incapable. Downing Street say he's sorry to have caused inconvenience. And Germany has been awarded football's World Cup finals in 2006. Well, that's all this Thursday lunchtime from the BBC News at One. Good afternoon.